Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. On Digging for Truth, we explore the reliability of the Bible in scientific and archaeological discoveries. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of the kings of Judah. His name is Jehoiakim. He only reigned for three months. But we have an extraordinary amount of evidence related to his reign. And our good friend, pastor, and archaeologist in training, Brian Wendell, is here to guide us through the biography, or as you call it, an archaeological, archaeological biography, excuse me, of Jehoiakim. Welcome back to the show, Brian. Thanks, Henry. It's great to be with you. Yeah, talking about archaeology and another Hebrew king. This is great. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. Now, listen, I stumbled there over your archaeological biography. See, that's a lot smoother now. So we're going to walk through uh, the life of a king who only reigned for three months, but very important because it's around the time when Judah is ready to uh, go the way of the buffalo, as it were. Uh why don't you give us an introduction uh, to, to our subject today? Sure. Well, some of the Hebrew kings reigned for incredibly long periods of time, right? Like Uzziah reigned, I think, 54 years. But then we have uh, a king like Jehoiakim, who reigned for three months. Um, and so, but, but as you mentioned, we have a lot of evidence for him. Um, the three months he reigned were largely in, in 597 BC, and the Bible summarizes his reign this way. It says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. That's in 2 Kings 24, verses 8 and 9. And the thing about Jehoiakim is he's he's actually referred to by three different names in the Bible. So he is referred to uh, as Jehoiakim in this passage. But when you look at other passages, the passage in 1 Chronicles, for example, his name is Jeconiah. And, and then that gets shortened to Kaniah in Jeremiah, but it's the same person. And so um, sometimes kings had different names. Uh, sometimes they had a given name and then a throne name. For example, uh, the king who takes over afterwards was named Mataniah, but he was given the name Zedekiah. So sometimes they had two names we don't really know. Sometimes their name was shortened. So clearly Jeconiah is shortened to Kaniah, um, but it's all the same person. We'll call him Jehoiakim for this episode. And and he only reigned three months in 597 BC. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, an important, a very important time leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, of course, by the Babylonian Empire. So, uh, speaking of that, so let's 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 give some histor. You'd like to give some historical background uh, related to the time when he reigned, because this is this is really important, and we have an embarrassment of riches as far as the archaeological evidence goes uh, from from this time period. Yeah, we really do. And so it helps us to understand, um, when we read an account of someone's life, the times in which that person lived. And Jehoiakim reigned at a just a turbulent time in the history of Judah. Um, his father, Jehoiakim, had um, had rebelled against the king of Babylon. And so in 2 Kings 24, verse 1, we read, during Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his va vassal for three years. But then he changed his mind and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And we don't know what happened to Jehoiakim, but um, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar's army besieging Jerusalem, Jehoiakim comes to the throne at 18 years of age. And, and what a time to ascend the throne. And um, so he was the one who ended up facing the wrath of King Nebuchadnezzar. And rather than fight a losing battle, he decided to give himself up to Nebuchadnezzar um, and surrender. And scripture records, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. We have that in 2 Kings 24, verse 10 to 17. Now, just to clarify again, so we know kind of the setting, Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Jerusalem on multiple occasions. He came in 605 BC, the year that he ascended the throne, and um, and that was the year that Daniel and his friends were taken into exile. And then we have this time, 597 BC, when uh, Jehoiakim gives himself up and goes into exile. And then later when, um, when 
uh, Jerusalem is eventually destroyed. And what's interesting is that Jehoiakim's um, captivity is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah too. Jeremiah prophesies that uh, Jeconiah or um, that uh, Jehoiakim will not will not return to Jerusalem, that he will die in captivity. But then um, Jeremiah records that there's this false prophet, Hananiah, who says, no, no, he's going to come back within two years. And we know from Scripture and we know from archaeology that he did not come back in two years and that Jeremiah was proved to be the true prophet and um, and Jehoiakim died in captivity in Babylon. I would imagine people didn't want to hear Jeremiah's bad news, even though he was the true prophet, right? That the, that the king would remain there. A spiritual battle that takes place there, still taking place in the church today as well, those kind of things. Okay, so... Uh, let's, let's talk about as we moved, you know, towards this sort of, uh, the siege of Jerusalem and sort of more of what's happening during this time period. And I should mention that you did a complete episode on Nebuchadnezzar, if anybody wants to check that out, but please go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so let's let's talk about about what we know from history at this time outside of the Bible. Now, I think that the Bible is a is a reliable historical document, and that that where we where we have historical evidence for it, it lines up with the Bible when properly understood. And so, um, when we look at um, at this particular event, what's interesting is that we don't just have the biblical account of it, we also have the Babylonian side of the story of what happened here. We have the Babylonian Chronicles. Now, the Babylonian Chronicles are a series of clay tablets that record the history of the kings of Babylon from um, Nabopolassar right through to Cyrus uh, of Persia. And so we have all of these uh, these events happening. And um, we believe that these particular ones were found in the ruins of Babylon by Rassam back in the 19th century, and they were brought to London. And the Babylonian Chronicle number five, which is dubbed the Jerusalem Chronicle, um, is the one that talks about this particular event. And this is what it says. It says, in the seventh year of the month of Kislimu, the king of Akkad, that's Nebuchadnezzar, mustered his troops, marched to Hattiland, that's the area that that the Babylonians referred to, that, that Judah was in, besieged the city of Judah on the second day of the month of Adaru, that would be February, March, 597, and he seized the city and captured the king, that's Jehoiakim. And then he appointed there a king of his own choice, that's Mataniah, who he changed his name to Zedekiah, and he received its heavy tribute from Babylon. And so, again, in, in every detail, it lines up exactly with Scripture. Babylonian account, biblical account, and even though Jehoiakim's not mentioned by name, he's clearly referred to, including the heavy tribute, which the Bible says were the treasures from the temple and the king's palace. Yeah, the ex parallels are extraordinary. Here you have this this tablet that's been discovered with, uh, I mean, almost uncanny, like the, almost you could compare the two of them together historically. I mean, it's really remarkable. Well, uh, great job, Brian. Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth as we're talking about King Jehoiakim. We'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Who is Jehoiakim, king of Judah, who only reigned for three months? Well, Brian Wendell's here telling us all about this king and the archaeology related to his life. Okay, Brian. Uh, let's uh, move into our next segment here of uh, information about the captivity in Babylon. Let's talk about the scriptural text first. Yeah, the last word that we have on Jehoiakim's life comes to us from um, from the end of Second Kings, Second Kings twenty five, and we know that Jehoiakim was taken into exile. He was uh, a prisoner there. Probably as the king of Judah, he wasn't in the the prison for the common. Uh, people, 
likely he uh, had some sort of a, a privileged position, maybe a house arrest or or a, uh, a prison for the royal prisoners. But here's what the Bible says. In 2 Kings 25, 27 to 30, it says, And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Meriadach, king of Babylon, his Babylonian name was Alwa Marduk, um, which in, in Hebrew becomes evil Meriadach, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments. And every day of his life, he dined regularly at the king's table for his allowance. A regular allowance was given to him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. And so at the age of 56... Jehoiakim is granted some measure of freedom and elevated to a privileged position um, during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar's son, evil Meriadoc or Awal Marduk, um, who reigned after Nebuchadnezzar. Got to love those biblical names, right? Uh, <laughs> translating them over into new languages can be uh, can be difficult. But but okay, so so we have this the presentation of the biblical text. So as we always do here on Digging for Truth is. All right, do we have something in the archaeological record that correlates or even matches really closely with it? Uh, what do you got for us, Brian? Well, we do indeed have evidence in the archaeological record. There was a group of tablets that were discovered uh, during the excavations in Babylon. Uh, between 1899 and 1917, Robert Caldaway led the excavations at Babylon. And um, in, a, in a room near the Ishtar Gate, they found this collection of cuneiform tablets. And it turned out that these tablets were uh, recorded the rations for the prisoners of Babylon. And on these tablets, they found the name of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah. And it records the rations that were given to him and that were given to uh, the royal family. So, for example, uh, one of them just reads to Jehoiakim, the king. Another one has been reconstructed to read 10 selah of oil to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, two and a half selah of oil to the five sons of the king of Judah. Yet another one reads 10 selah to Jehoiakim, two and a half selah for the five sons of the kings of Judah. These have been known as the Jehoiakim ration tablets, and they're important for several reasons. First of all, they clearly demonstrate that Jehoiakim was a prisoner in Babylon at this particular time, um, but he was still recognized as the king of Judah in the Babylonian records. Moreover, if you look at them, he receives more rations than the other prisoners do. And so already we see that he has some sort of a privileged position among the prisoners there. Now, these date to early in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, earlier in the reign, his 10th and his, his 35th year. Um, so this is before the period when evil Meriadoc elevated him. We see that already during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, um, Jehoiakim had some measure of a privileged position there. And of course, it confirms that he had sons. Now, the Babylonian record says five sons. If you read Second Chronicles 3, you'll see there that there are seven sons, I believe, that are recorded. And this can be easily explained during Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Um, he only had five sons at that time, and he had a couple of more sons later in life. That would be a simple solution to that. But, but anyway, these are really important documents that uh, and and cuneiform tablets that affirm uh, uh, and illuminate really what life was like for Jehoiakim in Babylon when he was in exile. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Almost remarkable. Just like in our last segment, we talk about almost like you know the like the two texts are talking to each other. So we have a little time to develop that a little bit here in this segment, Brian. Um, let's just talk about uh, a little bit about. The implications for that, not only for the original authorship of the text itself and what people commonly say about that, uh, but also the the preservation and transmission of the text. We we have a text in hand that was that that uh, that is copied later, but it reflects this accuracy from this much earlier period. Uh, give us your commentary on that, uh, Brian. Maybe for somebody who's watching for the first time. Yeah, when we look at the books of Kings and Chronicles, what we see is this consistent record of the kings of Judah and Israel. 
And uh, Kenneth Kitchen has done a great job of showing that um, kings in the ancient world, they kept this this uh, log or, or, or these annals um, that are recorded. And, and, and he has presented evidence that the books of Kings and Chronicles were written using the annals of the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel, which is why we have such an accurate record. Now, obviously, when we're talking about Jehoiakim, we're talking about a time frame that is that is closer because it's a, a period of 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 the the exile right right at the end of the kingdom of Judah and the exile in Babylon. So closer to the time when these books were being finally compiled and redacted. But um, so we see accuracy there. But but throughout our episodes that we've done together, we've seen that even earlier kings, there's there's incredible accuracy, not just with the Babylonian writings, but the previous Assyrian writings too. And you go right back to the Tel Dan Stella with the King of David. And so I think what this shows us is that the writers who um, who compiled the books of Kings and Chronicles, I believe, were using. Um, sources like the annals of the kings of Israel, possibly recorded even by some of the prophets um, as well, um, information recorded and, and, and compiled together a very accurate picture of the history of the kings of Judah and Israel. Yeah, I think that's extremely helpful, and it just really, really puts the authors right in that context. Even the practice of doing the annals themselves is a contemporaneous practice that the Bible is reflecting of what the other kings did as well. So it's just, it's just really re- remarkable. This, this period, I mean, you and I love archaeology no matter what the time period is, but this period, uh, we've just, I said earlier, we got an embarrassment of riches and it's just wonderful. Okay, Brian, well, we got to go to a break and we're, we're going to do that right now. And then we'll be back for our final segment with Pastor Brian Wendell. We'll be right back. ABR is excited to announce the publication of Volume 2 from our excavations at Kerbet el Makater. The volume details archaeological remains from about 350 BC to the 8th century. This includes a New Testament village that may have been visited by Jesus. Over 400 pages of analysis, photos, and maps. You can pick up a copy today by visiting BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with my friend, uh, colleague, Pastor Brian Wendell, uh, also archaeologist in training, Brian. Um, and uh, we're, we're glad to be back for our final segment here talking about uh, King Jehoiakim. Uh, only reigned for three months, but boy, we got to... <laughs> you wouldn't think you'd have so much archaeological evidence for a guy who was in charge for three months, but boy, do we ever have it. So let's keep talking. Um, you have a couple more discoveries that you would like to explore with the audience. Please go ahead. Yeah, so, so far we have talked about um, Babylonian inscriptions that directly refer to Jehoiakim. And and I'm so thankful that the Babylonians uh, recorded so many things and that we've been able to discover so many cuneiform tablets that, um, that affirm so many of the kings of Scripture and the Assyrians even before them doing that. But now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of discoveries, archaeological discoveries, that are maybe one step removed, but they certainly do continue to shed light and provide a little bit more of the background to help us understand the life of Jehoiakim. And the first is a seal that has been discovered. It's uh, it's currently in the Hike Museum in Haifa, and, and it is a red stone seal. And on that seal, right at the top, you see this, um, this Proto-Alea capital at the top. And, and the inscription says, belonging to Padayahu, which is Padiah, the king's son. Now, when we read the book of First Chronicles, we read First Chronicles 3, 17 and 18, and it records the name of Jehoiakim, but gives it his name Jeconiah. And it says this, it names the sons. It says, the sons of Jeconiah the captive, Shealtiel his son, Melkarim, Padiah, Shelnazar, Jeconiah, Hoshema, uh, Nebadiah. And so these are the sons of uh, Jehoiakim, and one of them is Padiah. And now we have this seal that says belonging to Padiah, the king's son. 
And um, the only king's son that we know of, Hebrew king's son that we know of um, from Scripture, would be Padiah, I believe. And so a lot of scholars think that this, because it dates to about that time frame based on the epigraphy, um, that it may indeed be the seal uh, from uh, Padiah when he was very young. And so this could be uh, the seal of Jehoiakim's uh, son. Now, we don't have a lot of the context around it. Uh, I right. think it may have come from the antiquities market. I'm not sure on that. Um, but but most people consider it to be authentic. The second one is really interesting. And um, maybe this would be a great episode to do sometime. Uh, the al Yahuda tablets. And um, so here's where this connects with Jeconiah. The Talmud records that Je- uh, sorry, um, Jehoiakim. The Talmud records that Jehoiakim um, eventually lived near Sippor in Babylon, in this time, in this uh, village named Nahardia. That's uh, a later name. And so, when we when we look at the Babylonian records, there is this group of tablets that seem to refer to this. Uh, town called uh, that they referred to as Al Yahudu, which means the Judean town, and it was near Sippar as well, based as from where the these tablets come from and what we can read. And there's a whole series of them. They they uh, describe uh, business transactions among Jewish exiles living in Babylon at that particular time. And so when we look at the Al Yahudu tablets, um, it, it just sheds more light on the type of um, of life that the Israelites lived, or that the, the Judahites lived. Remember, um, when you read the book of Jeremiah, what Jeremiah says is, hey, don't think you're getting out of there anytime soon. Settle down, build houses, get married, have kids, do business there. And, and that seems to be what we see happening. And if you can connect the Talmud to um, to this village, the description of Je- Jehoiakim living in this village, um, and, and the connection to the Al Yehuda tablets, it could provide some background to um, what life was like for not just Jehoiakim, but for the Judahites who were living in exile in that region at that particular time. Yeah, I find that to be another one of those angles that we find in the archaeological evidence. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like an inscription with a name, but now we got this village that has a similar name. So, like, you know, there's these logical connections you make to the historicity. Another interesting thing, Brian, is back to the seal for a moment. You know, the biblical text just seems to be mentioning this list of sons sort of in passing. You know, you see that with the genealogies a lot. Sometimes somebody's name is mentioned one time. We know nothing about their life. We know nothing about their biography. The biblical text doesn't tell us anything. And up out of the ground pops this discovery. Uh, It's just an extraordinary uh, way. I I almost feel like God is winking at us in, in a funny kind of way. You know, like, here's the evidence. If you have a heart of faith already inclined, you almost, you find joy in that. I certainly do uh, in seeing a discovery like that. Okay, Brian, we got a couple minutes left for you to do a wrap up, and maybe you can include for someone watching for the first time. You're a pastor, so maybe somebody's saying, "Wait a minute, you're a pastor. Why is all this archaeology important?" Now, you know, a lot of people probably draw the inferences pretty quickly with that, but maybe share your heart uh, in about a minute and a half here. Sure. Well. Um, for me, I love archaeology. I love history. I find it interesting. So there's an interest level, but it goes deeper than that for me. When I was a teenager, I got an old Thompson Chain reference Bible, and on the back of it, there was this archaeological supplement. And a, a period in my life as a teenager, when many teens are rebelling uh, or questioning the things that they have been taught, it was very helpful for me to read about a place in the Bible, for example, um, Ephesus and the and the riot uh, in Ephesus, and then to go to the back and see a, f- a photo of the great theater there, the place where that event actually took place, and learn a little bit more about the history of that site. And so I've always found that helpful in terms of affirming scripture uh, for people who question its historicity and, and for illuminating the scripture, for showing us a little bit more of what the world was like at that particular period of time. And so when I come to the story of Jehoiakim, Um, We see this 
um, represented very clearly. I mean, there's a handful of verses that talk about this king who only reigned for three months, and yet we have a, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the archaeological evidence for him, some of it directly affirming him and directly affirming specific events in um, in the Bible, but also um, illuminating scripture, telling us what life was like for those people in the exile. And we've said uh, over and over again on Digging for Truth that that that's the beauty of archaeology. It, it has an apologetic element in terms of in terms of affirming scripture, but it also has this this um, study element, this, this illumination element to help us better understand what God's trying to communicate to us. Amen, Brian. Thanks for being again on the show once again. Great job. Thanks so much, Henry. Great to be with you. Friends, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for watching Dinging for Truth, and we'll see you next time.